Time to take a look at Panzer Tactics with a focus on offensive actions. Now I did already a video on the basics of Panzer Tactics, be sure to check it out here. Before we take a look on how an example of a Panzer attack across an open field and then a detailed attack against the bunker works, we need to take a look at the missions of the Panzers and the various supporting elements. Since one of the key strengths of a German Panzer Division was it contained many different arms in one unit. Thus, besides Panzers, they also had organic infantry, artillery, anti-tank, recon, anti-aircraft and engineer units. As such, a Panzer Division was capable of combined arms warfare, an aspect that is often forgotten yet very crucial, because Panzers alone would not have accomplished very much. As such, infantry was still a key element in warfare. One key consideration was in which way the panzer attack was conducted in relationship to the infantry. There are three possibilities for use of tanks in battle. First, break in before the rifleman. Second, break in with the rifleman. Third, attack after the break in of the rifleman. The first two variants are only possible if the terrain is ideal for a panzer attack and also the enemy did not prepare proper anti-tank defenses like anti-tank ditches, obstacles or minefields. Third option has the downsides and it limits the use of combined arms and also the tanks have to wait. Yet since the infantry attack will stir up the enemy, the fallout attack from the panzers will have a stronger impact. Now let's look at the panzers during the attack. They were usually organized in three groups. The first group would focus on the anti-tank guns and artillery. This would be followed by a second group that attacks the enemy machine guns and pockets of resistance. Note that both of these units would mostly ignore enemy units that were protected by terrain. Yet there was a third group as well, in combination with the infantry it would get rid of the final resistance. Although it is important to note that the panzers should not stick to infantry and get limited by them too much, the main goal of the tanks was not just to break in, but to break through the enemy lines. Now let's look at the supporting arms and their missions. Let's start with the artillery, which is a very important element. One way to cover an attack by artillery is a moving barrage that moves ahead of the attacking troops usually called a creeping barrage. It with a pants attack there's a major issue using this approach. If the barrage moves too slowly, it slows down the panzers. But if it moves too fast, it is insufficient suppressing the enemy properly. As such, the artillery was used differently. Kaufmann notes in 1940, It has been noted that the flanks of the tank attack are particularly sensitive. Shielding these flanks by bombardment of explosive and smoke ammunition is the task of the artillery and smoke troops. Additionally, there are locations that the enemy will prepare for defense, like areas that can be passed by tanks, forest areas and evacuated villages. It is crucial that artillery suppresses these points. Furthermore, the enemy artillery must be suppressed to not interfere with the assembly of the tanks prior to the attack. The next branch is the infantry. It supports the tanks especially with heavy machine guns and infantry support guns providing additional firepower against enemy positions that are identified prior or during the attack, yet also against assumed positions as well. Furthermore, sometimes the infantry also must create the foundations for an attack, to cite from a late war manual for Panzergrenadier units. Often the Panzergrenadier unit armored must create the conditions for the use of tanks. Such tasks are fight for deployment positions and staging areas to allow for an armored attack, attacking an enemy in or behind an armor safe or anti-tank terrain, attack on mine barriers, rivers and sections, combat for villages and forests. This is closely linked to the mission of the engineers. They support the attack of the tanks in various ways. They strengthen if necessary earth for the panzers with fashioned, which are bundles of brushwood or other material. Additionally, they improve or create trails for panzers. This also includes clearing passages through friendly minefields. During the attack, the engineers are close by to remove obstacles, support the crossing of ditches, and clear passages through enemy minefields. Furthermore, they also help immobilize tanks. The next unit type is the Panzerjäger, literary tank hunter, the anti-tank elements of the division. Their job was to protect against other tanks during deployment, attack, and after the attack as well. Now, the job of the Luftwaffe and assigned air units was to provide reconnaissance on enemy troops, yet also terrain. Then also defend the assembly area against enemy recon and attacks. During the offensive, air units would attack enemy troops moving into position or strengthening the defense. Additionally, known positions and fortifications would be attacked by Stukas and other units. In that way, air units could be used as flying artillery and suppress the enemy. As noted by Oskar Munzel, a panzer general, 
The mission of the attacking panzer formations was to exploit the effect of the Luftwaffe immediately to prevent the resurgence of the resistance. If you want to learn more how panzer units and close air support units coordinated, be sure to check out this video. And finally, the flak units, the anti-aircraft units. They of course would protect against enemy air attacks during the assembly and also attack. Additionally, would protect against enemy tank attacks as well. One source specifically notes that the flak does especially well against heavy tanks. So since we have the basic, let's look at how an attack was performed. This is the situation before the attack. Here's the Hauptkampflinie, the main line of resistance, usually just called HKL. With a forest to the right side of the map, another small forested area right of the center. Two hills in the back, one behind the swampy area, and one directly in front of the HKL. Additionally, several evacuated villages as well. Reconnaissance reported various enemy positions, two on the hills, one in the forested area, and two in the empty villages. Furthermore, two machine gun positions close to the front, a suspected anti-tank gun in the forest, and six pieces of artillery behind the hills. The area in front of the attacking panzer formations would be hit with smoke. Additionally, both flanks would be covered with smoke and also high explosive shells as well, to protect the flanks of the panzer attack. Furthermore, the hill next to the swamp, the evacuated village in the center and the forested area would be attacked with artillery fire until the infantry arrives. Similar, the enemy artillery would be engaged as well until the tanks would start to engage them directly. So let's look how the panzers should engage the artillery. An attempt must be made to enclose enemy batteries and destroy them by fire and the onset of rolling force. Attacking from the front is wrong, since it's easy for the enemy gunners to keep the tank in the gun sights and shooting at them with anti-tank shells. As such, it is recommended to move diagonally or even laterally to the enemy artillery, as shown here with a degree range from around 90 to 30 degree. Furthermore, the speed and direction should be changed regularly to prevent the enemy from properly leading his aim. In principle, the enemy guns are to be overthrown and destroyed by ramming, in order to prevent them being used later by the enemy in favorable moments. Now one key practice when attacking was using the principle of fire and movement. It basically means that one part of a unit would watch and cover the other part which was advancing. The first was the caterpillar-like movement, raupenartiges Vorgehen, and the other the leapfrog movement, sprungweises Vorgehen. The caterpillar-like movement is slower and a more secure variant. In this case, the group moving forward only moves to the level of the covering group. This is in contrast to the leapfrog movement. In this case, the moving leaps ahead of the covering group, thus moving less cautiously than the previous version. Caterpillar movement has the advantage that it allows the unit to unify its fire of the whole unit at times. Additionally, it is easier to coordinate. Now its drawback is that it's obviously slower and it's best used in coordination with infantry and if the terrain is difficult to observe. In contrast, the leapfrog movement is quicker and also more flexible. As such, it's easier to allow for flanking the enemy. The main drawback is it's harder to coordinate and it is best used during reconnaissance and security operations in open terrain. And finally, we look at an attack on a pillbox with tanks. Here's the general setup. There's one large pillbox in the center and two smaller pillboxes covering its rear and the flanks. The pillboxes have shooting slits at various positions. The large pillbox also has an armored turret in the center. Additionally, there are some enemy machine guns and positions located on the flanks as well. For 1940, it was recommended to use Panzer IIs and Panzer IVs against pillboxes, of course in combination with infantry, engineers and artillery to be more specific. In general, the combat group that attacks a pillbox consists of a tank platoon and a platoon of riflemen that is reinforced by a squad of engineers. In short, around 50 riflemen, 10 engineers and 4 Panzer IVs. Additionally, heavy machine guns were assigned as well. In the first phase, the machine gunners engage the enemy positions, including the turret of the pillbox. Furthermore, the artillery uses smoke shells to prevent the flanking pillboxes from engaging and uses high explosive shells to suppress the rear of the pillbox. Of course, it also suppresses the enemy off-map artillery, something every company of heroes player would love to do, but I digress. Shortly before the assault begins, the artillery also engages the pillbox itself. Thus, under the cover of the fire, the Kampfgruppe consisting of panzers and infantry closed in on the pillbox. The panzers move using fire and movement. The Stu providing covering fire engaging the turret, firing slits and surrounding area. The Stu close in on the pillbox. 
Once these are close enough, they go into position and provide covering fire while the first group closes in. Meanwhile, the infantry advances as well. Heavy equipment that is not needed immediately like demolition charges can be stored on the panzers. Once the panzers reach the barbed wire protecting the final defensive line of the pillbox, the two groups split it up. One group provides covering and suppresses the pillbox and surrounding forces, whereas the second group rolls over the barbed wire defenses to provide the infantry with easier access. Additionally, engineers follow now as well and support the infantry in taking out the pillboxes. Of course, the panzers provide cover support, here by firing at the firing slits and entry doors. So if you ever run into a pillbox blocking your way to work or school, you know what to do. To summarize, although many people seem to be in awe of the German panzers and technology, in general the key of success for the German panzer forces was combined arms warfare, something I discuss also in my video on why the Wehrmacht was so combat effective. A panzer combines firepower, mobility and armor protection, yet lacks visibility, indirect fire capabilities. Additionally, it is expensive, rather unreliable and easy to hear and spot. As such often needs to be supported not only during the battle, but also during the assembly and other phases, which are usually rarely discussed, yet absolutely crucial for the success of an attack. I hope you learned something new. If you did, consider supporting me on Patreon. Remember, every single dollar helps. Thank you here to Torbay for helping me continuously with definitions and terminology. Sources are in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.